Welcome to another episode of Mormon Discussion Podcast. I'm your host, Bill Real. Grateful for the chance to be with you today. Um, today, I want to talk about how the church has made the effort to mainstream. And uh, I'm really excited to share some of these thoughts with you. Uh, we'll start off here. I'll put a PowerPoint up on the screen. Um, also, just want to note, too, by the way, uh, we've got brand new uh, technology and equipment that we are using. Uh, I'm going to get rid of here a little bit of uh, this overlay. So uh, we've got a bunch of new equipment and stuff that we're using. You can see that the camera uh, is a much clearer picture, uh, better lighting. I just want to thank from the bottom of my heart, uh, a, a donor to the podcast reached out over the last couple of months and has offered to help us upgrade our sound equipment uh, for the Mormonism Live show. Uh, so I do have this equipment available to use for the other shows that we do, such as Mormon Discussion. Uh, I just want to say thank you to that donor for uh, providing uh, the financial means by which we could upgrade our camera equipment and our sound equipment. I hope, folks, you are all uh, hearing this and uh, appreciate uh, each of you following along today. Uh, so let's jump uh, into it. I wanted to see if I had any sort of background here I can put up, but let's go ahead and grab uh, the slideshow here. And so uh, what we did is I wanted to title this episode, Mainstreaming Mormonism, Watering Down the True Church. And I wanted to talk about the various things that have changed in the last few years. So I really, uh, from the 20,000 foot view, from standing back and kind of looking at all the things that have happened uh, in terms of the church. And so we'll start off with posing what the problem was. And it's really a multifold problem, but it is the question was asked to Richard Bushman uh, he was at the a home of members. There were there was a crowd of doubters there who were free to ask questions, and Richard Bushman addressed those questions. And the question, one of them to Richard Bushman, was, in your view, do you see room in Mormonism for several narratives of a religious experience, or do you think that in order for the church to remain strong, they would have to hold to that dominant narrative? And uh, Richard Bushman said, I think that for the church to remain strong, it has to reconstruct its narrative. The dominant narrative is not true. It cannot be sustained. The church has to absorb all of this new information, or it will be on very shaky grounds. And that's what it's trying to do. And it will be a strain for a lot of people, older people especially, but I think it has to change. And so Bushman uh, is noting you know, there's a problem with the history. When you look at the truth claims of the church, the trouble with Mormonism is that it hinged its truth claims to historical events. And we and Mormonism also uh, kept a really good historical record of, of events, of things happening. And the critics of Mormonism also kept a very good historical record. And what we find is that in all of the issues around the truth claims of the church, Every one of those truth claims that hinges on, almost all of them, hinge on uh, historical events, the critic has a better explanation for those historical events than the faithful narrative of the church. And so Richard Bushman is noting, at least in part, that the church has to change its, uh, its approach to history. It has to tell its history very differently, and we'll get to that in a moment. But there are other issues too. There are problems with the theology in terms of there are things that we Mormons believe. And I refer to myself, I'm, an, I'm not a Mormon anymore, by the way. I was excommunicated a few years ago for telling the truth about the church uh, as part, in part this podcast uh, series that we do here called Mormon Discussion. And uh, the other problems that they've got is that when it comes to, for instance, there's embarrassing parts of theology that the church has needed to distance itself from. We'll get to an example or two of that later. But the theology is problematic because the rest of the outside world, so the members are struggling with the history. The general public uh, struggles with accepting Mormonism because it's weird and has this really strange theology. Uh, the church also has its uh, public perception around how it handles things, such as its corporate greed, which we'll get to in a little bit, uh, multiple child, you know, numerous child abuse cases, uh, ways in which it 
pushes back against its insider critics like Sam Young, who uh, asked that the church require that there always be two leaders in a room with children, for instance. And um, we'll, we'll get into examples of each of these, but it's, it's like it's a table with, you know, four or five, six legs of the table and every one of the legs is defective. And so they have to remodel every leg of the table uh, in order to, to solve the problem that at least in part, Richard Bushman is pointing to. And so the first thing I want to mention here is the history to the inside basic members of the church. And so you have this New Saints curriculum, which is a much different telling of church history than the even the higher educational level of uh, institute or religious classes at Brigham Young University, where they would be taught church history. I don't remember. I've got the book behind me on the shelf, but uh, the church history book that was used at BYU or in institute uh, told a very faithful, watered-down uh, telling of the history, did not really make its members aware of any of the problems. And because the problems are so sort of just kind of there in the ether, uh, most members can't help but bump into these a little bit. And the church, in order to respond to them, decided to tell a more accurate, more honest telling of its history, which is these uh, books here, Saints, Standard of Truth, Saints, Boldly, Nobly, and Independent, Saints, No Unhallowed Hand. Uh, and so you get sort of that that telling of the history. But these books are still not telling the truth. They're still not being honest to the problem of, of how messy and contradictory church history is. But this is to the bare-bone basic kind of members of the church, the folks who aren't going to read a lot, but they want to read something. Um, you also have your gospel topic essays, which originally were sort of untalked about, sort of hidden away on the church's website, often multiple clicks deep. Bishops didn't want to share this, and to a large extent still don't, didn't want to share it with the membership. The church really didn't talk out loud about these. It was really designed that if you were having doubts, if you were having questions, you could you could go find something, but you but you really had to know it was there and you had to sort of uh, go looking for it. And so you had the gospel topic essays, which really to some extent are probably designed for the believer who has a family member, a coworker, a friend who is pointing out to them the widespread problems with uh, church risk, church history. And uh, they want something, the church wants something for those folks to be able to read, to combat that, to at least in their head go, I get to dismiss my friend. I get to dismiss my coworker or my child or my parent. They don't know what they're talking about. My church has answers to these questions. But there's also been in-depth discussions about the gospel topic essays, and they are also carefully worded. They also obfuscate the issues. They also are deeply dishonest. And um, while they at least mention the problems, which is something Mormonism had never done up to this point, and sur sort of validated all of the critical information in terms of like, hey, these are real problems, there are real issues. Because even when you read the gospel topic essays, you're made uncomfortable by Joseph Smith's polygamy, by the fact that they've got multiple solutions with all of them having problems with them in solving the Book of Abraham translation conundrum. Um, when you look at the race and priesthood, you have to sit with how did prophets and seers and revelators over hundreds of years uh, get things wrong. And um, so, but at least the the basic gist of a problem is being talked about. And so you have members of the church that now sort of have to go like, yeah, you know, my 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 kid or my parent who left and tells me the church isn't true, there is something to what they're saying. Um, but I, I, again, anybody who is listening to this podcast who thinks that these problems are solved in a way that the faithful responses make more rational sense, um, are more 
uh, reasonable and logical than the critics, I would welcome you to come on. But you would have to be, unlike Jacob Hansen, you'd have to be susceptible to me asking you the questions I want to ask to see if I can poke holes in that and see if I can walk you into how illogical the faithful responses are. And often when people say, oh, I'll do that, Bill, I'll come on. They very much limit what directions we can go in. They don't want to have the full conversation. So if there is somebody out there who is a believer and you think the conundrums in church history can be solved in a way that the faithful responses are better answers than the critical responses, please, by all means, message uh, below. Um, you can do it off the side, but I won't see it when this is over. So please comment. Uh, in the comments below the YouTube video, and I will be happy to uh, reach out to you and, and give me a way to get to a hold of you. Uh, you can message me on Facebook Messenger as well. Uh, you can email the podcast Mormon Discussions with an S on the end, podcast with an S on the end at gmail.com. Mormon Discussions Podcasts at gmail.com. And I will arrange for you to come on the show. We can pick, you know, one of the difficult topics. And we can have a long form conversation where you explain to me uh, how we solve the problem as I'll pose it to you and you saw how you would solve it and then allow me to answer the follow up questions to see if that actually works. So I just want to note gospel topic essays more to kind of a person who really does have some doubts and wants to really get some some good information, at least from their perspective from the church, even though I'm going to acknowledge on the front end uh that this doesn't this doesn't add up easy the gospel topic essays don't solve the problem so there's that you have the joseph smith papers project and so uh again what we're talking about here on the front end is history and so the church has created a new history inside the uh inside the correlated curriculum of the two-hour block saints it's created the gospel topic essay, so you can go to the church website and you can find uh, a discussion about the major problems. Then you've got the Joseph Smith papers, which are more of an academic exposure to the issues uh, by them laying out all of the data in terms of the documentation uh, that is in regards to Joseph Smith, his life and his teachings, uh, the ways in which he operated the church. You get the Joseph Smith Papers Project, and also these have been damning. These deeply validate uh, across tons of issues that the critic was actually right, that things did happen uh, at times the way uh, the church used to sort of deny that it was occurring. And so these journals and documents, we've used these numerous times on Mormonism Live, a live show we do on Wednesdays at 6.20 p.m. on this YouTube channel. but. Uh, we've used the Joseph Smith papers numerous times to document certain events in the church, such as one example would be Oliver Cowdery's letter to uh, his brother, Warren Cowdery, Cowdery uh, telling his brother about Joseph Smith's inappropriate uh, interactions with Fanny Elgar. Uh, and so that's just one of them, but there's been numerous episodes we've done utilizing these. Uh, the Joseph Smith papers have been very helpful from a critical point of view, to help substantiate uh, many of the troublesome issues. And so you get this, which is sort of for the person outside the church. You can go to Deseret Book, you can go online to Amazon, you can order the Joseph Smith papers, and you would get these big books and you can read through and, and read all the original documentation uh, around Joseph Smith and his life, uh, those who had interactions with him. But again, thus far, all we're talking about here is history. Then we come up on the artwork. Again, if you go into an LDS chapel with all the old artwork that used to hang there or go into a temple before they've remodeled them, you see a certain kind of artwork. And it is artwork that substantiates the old, uh, faithful, watered-down historical narrative. And the church in recent years has uh, promoted artwork that is more honest to its history, to the historical events uh, that it was founded upon. And there's sort of a mixed message going on. In part, there's still dishonesty. In part, they're trying to control the narrative. We'll get to some of that in a moment. But also, I want to give them credit. 
they are sharing artwork which exposes the narrative the way the critic was telling it uh, and showing it was problematic. And the church used to go like, that's oh, all anti-Mormon propaganda. Don't, don't believe what they're saying. And in recent years, the artwork has been more reflective, not perfect. They've also put out pieces of artwork or made videos, for instance, uh, for the church. And then suddenly like said like, Oh, we don't want to show it that much, like pull back. And so there's one video, for instance, that shows the hat and the rock in the hat. And then it, they ended up editing the film and made it so that the hat was just kind of way off in the corner and barely visible. So they could sort of say the hat's in there, but we're not certainly not going to emphasize it. And I just want to acknowledge though, on some level, a little more healthiness with the artwork, but also still a lot of deception um, in terms of the art as well. And so there's a lot of the old artwork that's been left up that is not accurate. Uh, and so I just want to know artwork is another facet. So we have history, we have artwork. Uh, theology is the next one. The church is in the middle of changing its theology in really significant ways. And we've covered uh, lots of these on Mormonism Live in the last year or so. Uh, but I'll give you one example. I think it's a damn good solid uh, example of this. If you go on to the LDS newsroom, and you look up the frequently asked questions. The LDS newsroom, which speaks officially for the church. Question number 12, do Latter-day Saints believe they will get their own planet? Answer, no. No, this idea is not taught in Latter-day Saints scripture, nor is it a doctrine of the church. This misunderstanding stems from speculative comments, unreflective of scriptural doctrine. Latter-day Saints believe that we are all sons and daughters of God and that all of us have the potential to grow during and after this life to become like our Heavenly Father. The church does not, has never purported to fully understand the specifics of Christ's statement that in my Father's house are many mansions. The problem with that is that's not honest. So one example, and I'll get two examples of where they have taught it. The first one here is below. This is President Nelson, 2018 Christmas devotional titled Four Gifts That Jesus Christ Offers You. Now here's the President Nelson quote. A fourth gift from our Savior is actually a promise, a promise of life everlasting. This does not mean simply living for a really, really, really long time. Everyone will live forever after death, regardless of the kingdom of glory for which they may qualify. Everyone will be resurrected and experienced immort experience immortality. But eternal life is so much more than a designation of time. Eternal life is the kind and quality of life that Heavenly Father and His beloved Son live. When the Father offers us everlasting life, He is saying, in essence... When the Father offers us everlasting life, he is saying in essence, and here's the money line, if you choose to follow my son, if your desire is really to become more like him, then in time you may live as we live and preside over worlds and kingdoms as we do. Wait a minute. Do Latter-day Saints believe they will get their own planet? No. But if you're faithful and exalted, then you will preside over worlds and kingdoms as we do. See, this is the game that Mormonism plays. It, it might have some way of going like, well, we're telling the truth in both instances. But it doesn't feel like it. It feels like an obfuscation, and it looks like a contradiction. It sounds like a contradiction. It sure as hell tastes like a contradiction. It must be a contradiction. And whatever way one would go about explaining this, one would have to, I think, acknowledge, yeah, we carefully worded it. We wanted to give the appearance of one thing in one, and then we wanted to be able to tell another thing in the other. Um, but that's dishonest. Again, these are prophets, seers, and revelators, and the only true and living church upon the earth with which the Lord is well pleased. And uh, so I just want to note 
that in that past instance, the church isn't telling the truth. That's the church. If you're a believer, that's the church you belong to. It's a church that doesn't tell the truth. It contradicts itself because it wants the general public to know, to believe one thing about the church. It wants the members who are young to believe another thing about the church. It wants the old people who were taught a gospel 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago to be able to keep believing what they believe without too much cognitive dissonance. So, so they get to believe something else. And, and the reality is that uh, those of us who have read deeply the history and recognize this thing doesn't add up uh, can point out to you pretty easily numerous contradictions. And we'll get to some of those uh, in the end. Here's another one. This gospel fundamentals book is for areas in the church where there is not a large number of membership. Hence, there isn't wards and stakes. There is uh, uh, branches and districts or maybe even something smaller. And so you can still order this book, I believe, from Deseret Book. Uh, and if somebody in the live chat, if you want to look this up, gospel fundamentals, see if you can buy it from Deseret Book, see if you can buy it from other locations, and then put into the, the live chat over on the side. If you'll put there, uh, yes, you could still find it. and uh, will you put a link to it so that folks who don't believe that can go order it if they want to? But this book still exists. Again, if I go back to the previous slide, do Latter-day Saints believe that they will get their own planet? The answer is no, except in their own curriculum, Gospel Fundamentals. Chapter 36, Eternal Life. Where will we go after the final judgment? I'm going to read that very last paragraph. To live in the highest part of the celestial kingdom is called exaltation or eternal life. To be able to live in this part of the celestial kingdom, people must have been married in the temple, must have kept the sacred promises they made in the temple. They will receive everything our Father in heaven has and will become like him. They will even be able to have spirit children and make new worlds for them to live on. That sure sounds a hell of a lot like you get your own planet. But remember, do you get your own planet? No. Yet, exalted beings will be able to have spirit children and make new worlds for them to live on. That feels like blatant dishonesty. And I just want to note that. So again, uh, the theology is changing. It's a free agency. I grew up. Ask anybody who's my age or older who grew up in Mormonism, probably even 10 years younger, anybody in their 30s uh, or older, and they will tell you free agency was such an important part of, of uh, Mormon theology, of Mormon doctrine. It was the bare bone basics of what we were taught. And uh, Elder Bednar comes along and he changes uh, free agency and calls it moral agency and redefines it so that rather than being free to choose, you're actually obligated to choose. You don't have the freedom anymore to do so. Um, you can't, if God is real and if Mormonism is the true and living church upon the earth with which God is well-pleased and it really does have prophets, seers, and revelators, then its doctrine, doctrine should be consistent. And it's not. Doctrine isn't consistent at all. And when you read uh, something like Charlie Harrell, I highly recommend, by the way, Charlie Harrell's book, This Is My Doctrine, where he goes through every uh, important doctrine of the church and shows how it has changed over time. And so I just want to note uh, that the doctrine and theology is much different today. Uh, another example uh, oh, I don't want to get to this one yet, but let me see if I can skip past some of these. Oh, yeah, let's go back here. So this is another example. The church in its uh, approved missionary works that the missionaries could feel safe having on their mission to read, The Great Apostasy by James E. Talmadge. Uh, the Great Apostasy by James E. Talmadge. The, the uh, Great Apostasy in Mormonism was a founding doctrine, a founding piece of our theology. And I haven't seen anybody post yet a link to the book. If you couldn't find it, please let me know. Maybe I'll try to do so towards when the show is over and 
if folks had questions or something. Don't, if you have questions, please uh, hold them off until the end. I'm not really able to go through the PowerPoint, have the conversation with you, and pay attention to the comments. Uh, I am sort of seeing them. But again, if someone could find that book of, uh, I think it was, what was it? Gospel Principles, Gospel Fundamentals. Uh, very much would appreciate that. So the great apostasy in terms of how the ancient church was established, how Christ established a church, what that church looked like, what happened to that church, how a great apostasy occurred, how Protestantism and Catholicism corrupted the teachings of Jesus Christ, the doctrines of the early church, the priesthood authority, was something that was clearly taught to me and other folks my age. And in the modern moment, you have on the other side of the screen there, the Maxwell Institute writing a book called Ancient Christians, an introduction for Latter-day Saints, where they decimate multiple parts of the great apostasy. So now it's a little apostasy. And they also validate, while they still want to try to say, well, yeah, yeah, Christ still did create a church. It's just not the way we thought it was. They validate that Christ was a Jew, that Christ uh, lived and died within the Jewish faith, that he never left the Jewish faith and set up a church, that that wasn't real. And at Maxwell Institute is a direct arm of the church and of BYU, and they can't do things without the church, uh, churches at least on some level, stamp of approval. And there have been multiple talks when they start to get out of line where Elder Holland and others uh, tell them to get back in line. And But these guys are trying to be academic. They're trying to be loyal to the church and tell the truth. And they're having a hell of a time doing both of those because that's a, that's a really difficult line to walk. Um, so there's that. So there, so the theology and doctrine of the church is changing drastically. Um, we're really getting to a place where the Mormonism that I grew up with, Radio Free Mormon grew up with, many of you grew up with, it just really doesn't exist anymore, except in the minds of the older generation of members. Um, I also want to note, like their approach to the youth is uh, is interesting and it's drastically different than the Mormonism I grew up with. Um, I don't, I won't be able to show these videos, but the church in recent years has done these music festivals. And it is like, it's like if you turned MTV on or, or VH1 or, uh, you know, you tried to watch a music video that's really high quality, well-produced, uh, the church has all of these music musicians, and there's an entire YouTube channel that you didn't even know existed that I'll I'll show here at the end. We'll go through a few of these, but um, they're creating these music festivals for the youth to try and sort of present sort of that mega church kind of image uh, to the members, to the younger members, and try to get them to see the church as hip and cool. And not this thing that it used to be, which the thing it used to be, it was, I was taught as a convert when I was 17, I'm 45 years old. I, I joined the church in 1996. And when I joined the church in 1996, we made it clear that other churches are very, uh, have a lot of grandeur, a lot of uh, extra things to decorate it, to a live band, you know, handing out coffee, um, we're not, we're not going to do that. We have the burlap walls. We have no artwork in our chapels. We have very modest decorations outside the chapel. Uh, the building is really plain. And it's those untrue churches that apostatized. They're the ones who do all this flamboyant stuff. It's not, it's not us who do that. And in the modern moment, the church is... Uh, is very much doing these kinds of things. So the music festivals, again, have these live concerts, uh, various musicians singing. Um, the, the youth groups have a very decorative stage, and um, they're very well decorated as well. The church does these uh, young kid programs called Friend to Friend with these stages and props. 
this is so different from the Mormonism I grew up with. And again, the church has channels on YouTube to children, to youth, that I don't think most of you even know about. Like, you don't even know these things exist. So they're redoing the branding, right? We know that the logo's changed. So the church has gone to this like half-buried bathtub. I, I, when I grew up as a kid in Sandusky, Ohio, there was this one house right near the overpass that had a half-buried bathtub with Mother Mary in it standing just like Jesus is here. And uh, this logo from the church is something that they're really trying to get away from Moroni and Mormonism. If you go by all the temples today, most of the new ones built today don't have a Moroni up top. The church is distancing itself from Joseph Smith and the Joseph Smith history. You're going to see it. Watch it. I'm 45 years old. I hope I have another 20, 25 years here. This church is going to continue to distance itself from the early history of the church and from its founder, Joseph Smith, and from those other early leaders, Brigham Young and uh, those who followed. And the church is really trying to mainstream itself. So the logo is a big part of that. Also the website, right? No more LDS.org. This isn't Latter-day Saint.org. This is churchofjesuschrist.org. I just heard a story. I don't know if it was RFM who told me. Somebody told me that, and I forget who it was, but somebody told me that uh, they knew someone who had investigated the church and joined, got baptized. And then after a few weeks of attending, they they said something to someone else in the war, and they said, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. Did I join the Mormon church? Did I, is that what I did? And somebody informed them like, yeah, this is the Mormon church. But the Mormon church doesn't tell you anymore that it's the Mormon church. It doesn't call itself the LDS church. It's now the church of Jesus Christ.org. Its logo is the church of Jesus Christ. Latter-day Saints is de-emphasized. LDS is sort of de-emphasized by the website change. The word Mormon became a really bad word. I mean, if you say Mormon around a believing Latter-day Saint, they... They just about have a hissy fit telling you that that's not the proper name of the church. And so changing the logo, changing the website address, not using it in the language as much, you're going to see that continue and you're going to see that grow stronger. This church does not want the outside world to be watching it and observing that, oh, that's the Mormon church. They are trying to uh, water things down where they can. Uh, in order to fit in. Again, it's not everywhere. In some places, they have been more honest about the history. Not honest, but more honest about the history. Okay, so you have that. There is uh, the branding of the logo. There's the the website. Uh, so we noted branding changes, history changes, artwork changes, curriculum changes, theology changes. The church is changing quite a bit. So I'm going to throw up on the screen now um, some of the stuff here that I was going through um, to show you. So here is LDS365.com. They're just a blog site, but they're promoting uh, the friend to friend uh, show. And it's like it's like watching Mr. Dress Up or Mr. Rogers or uh, you know, if, if you if you watched when I was a kid, uh, you guys were all at church on Sunday, but I wasn't a member until I was 17. I watched a show called Hickory Hideout. Um, there is this effort to sort of appeal as cool and hip looking uh, to the kids and to sort of not have anything that really looks Mormon uh, or LDS. So this is the channel. This is gospel for kids. So this is the church's channel. Uh, in fact, when Jesus was on the earth, oops. he helped. All I don't want that to play. Sorry about that. So when I go to about, I mean, again, you can see it right here. Um, Gospel for Kids is the children's channel of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I, I can't get that to play or to open up, but you can see it right here. And so I didn't even know this existed. There's 71,000 subscribers, almost 72,000. They got 197 videos. Um, nobody's really watching these. I mean, 4.8 thousand and here's one that's got 45,000, but 3.2, 3.2, 2.4, 3.8. I mean, we do a show on Wednesday night that every one of our episodes essentially does better than this. Uh, and so there's really nobody watching these, but the church does them. It puts them out. It has this 
channel just for the children of the church. And so we can get rid of that. Get rid of that. Church advertises it in their Meridian uh, magazine. So there's another update about the friend to friend event. So the kid, the kid event. Uh, here's the website new on the church newsroom, uh, friend to friend uh, being advertised. Here's the strive to be. This is the youth channel. Uh, and so, again, if you click some of these, you just get these really well done, well produced music videos. Some are in English, some are in other languages. Um, but they have these youth concerts, these youth music festivals. Uh, and we'll get to some of those here in just a moment. Worldwide uh, events for the youth. And notice, too, I mean, you get. You get a person who is African American, an African American girl, and you get a Hispanic. Um, you know, there's various uh, races, ethnicities being represented. Um, but again, just noting that this church is wanting to look sort of like that look you'd find on like TV evangelism, uh, mega churches, that kind of thing. And so there's there's that. All right, this is the youth festival. I'm not going to play it, but you get you know you get people dancing and well done songs. The camera quality is exceptional. Uh, the church is really going out of its way to sort of fit in and belong. Uh, let's see here if I can get that next little scene to show up. Oop. Let's see if this works. Uh, in the meantime, I'll I'll move on here. So. Youth Music and Arts Festival. Again, I've gone to music festivals. Uh, this isn't exactly what they are. Uh, reggae music, uh, more of a woke crowd, uh, much more liberal crowd. But the church is trying to capitalize on that to the point where, if I go back to the slide, you know, on that picture on the right, you get sort of like a psychedelic kind of imagery. Um, the church is trying to look like it belongs in that crowd, but that's not the messaging or the perspective that the church is offering. Uh, so here's the music festival again. Um, again, the, the more discussion about it, but you get like, again, picture of the performances. Uh, there's another one just happened on the 15th of August, and I think there's another one coming up in like November. Uh, so, uh, also, I want to just sh I'll show this here in just a second, too. And that should be pretty much all of them. But just today, the uh, Faith Matters group put together uh, a big conference. And this is where people who have doubts and questions are supposed to be able to go to receive resources and help. And I'll play this. Hopefully you guys can hear it. So you end up there with the church doing, uh, this this group uh I'm trying to change something here give me two two seconds sorry about that so you get the church uh doing this faith mat again the church isn't i should i should correct myself so let me let me do that the church isn't directly behind faith matters that's a private group made up of active mormons who want to help people stay know that there's a nicer, kinder, more honest way to do that, or at least that we, we can't have an approach that's anything less than that anyway. And so uh, the church isn't directly involved, but these folks are trying to convey to believers who have doubts, who want to try to find a way to make it work, convey to them some sort of approach to Mormonism that would allow them to stay and still be active, somewhat faithful, maybe believing Latter-day Saints. And, um, but I had several people who went to this Faith Matters 
uh, conference that's going on today. I think it's still going on right now. And what they said to me was, we're not hearing anything. There's no mention of Joseph Smith. It looks like 95% mainstream Christianity. There's music, there's lights. A lot of uh, a lot of things are being done to create elevation emotion, whether it's music, whether it's inspiring messages. There's an effort to make people feel good. They're saying that there's issues in the church that need to be, you know, that, that they understand people have doubts over, but they're not offering any answers to those doubts. And they're not going into these issues. They're not offering solutions. It really is like, hey, we know it's messy. We don't have good answers, but let's just all feel good. And let's not really have much Mormon flavoring. So the the one gentleman who went to it and shared some of the information with me said, there's like no Joseph Smith. There's like a 5% of Mormonism. And the other 95% feels like a mega church or mainstream Christianity. And uh, that seems to be, again, that seems to be the direction that the church is going. Um, to look hip and cool, to create sort of a mainstream Christian look. But I think they're going to run into lots of problems uh, doing that. I'm going to get through here. because So the things that they change, branding, history, artwork, curriculum, theology, but there are other things that aren't changing, right? Leadership, nepotism. When you look at the top 15 of this church, they are either directly related to or, or related by marriage to the previous generation of leadership. In other words, uh, in other words, this church constantly has the same families that are in the leadership of the church. And uh, you know, Elder Irings related to Spencer Kimball, who's related to, you know, it, it really is just passed down through family lines. And so you have leadership nepotism, you have harmful rhetoric to towards those who have doubts, harmful rhetoric towards uh, that create unsafe boundaries for child abuse. We will get into, I got it down in the corner, they're unsafe boundaries. There are patterns of corruption. When you look at the SEC scandal that happened recently, when you look at Elder Oaks lying about electroshock therapy, when you listen to the leaders uh, talk about never hiding anything, there's just this harmful rhetoric that, that hurts people. You have patterns of corruption. Again, the SEC, for instance, is a great example. You have homophobic policies. Elder Oaks, just in the most recent conference, got up there and did the old shtick again. You have patriarchy and sexism. You have a lack of transparency around financials, a lack of transparency around history. Uh, you have continued dishonesty around history. You have corporate greed and malfeasance, and you have unsafe boundaries for children, for women, uh, for for those who are vulnerable to abuse of one sort or another. Um, the church really isn't fixing the problems. It's just trying to change its image, and it's trying to at least look like it tackled uh, the historical issues within the church. But that's not really what's happening. In the end, it is still 15 old, almost exclusively white men hoarding billions of dollars while perpetuating an intentionally dishonest version of history and using shame and manipulation to create loyalty uh, and belief. And so, folks, I, I would encourage you to really keep a close eye on the collective moves this thing does. And if you sit back and just sort of watch over the next year, two, five, ten, notice the kinds of changes. Notice the things that used to be true that are no longer true today. Notice the ways in which they present how our history unfolded that they used to not do before. And just notice that they will give you what they need to, to keep perpetuating this thing. But at the end, it's really these old guys who are able to maintain a Large amount of wealth. We just went into on Mormonism Live this past Wednesday. We just went into how Elder Ballard, Elder Gay, and Elder Renland allegedly invested, and we showed the some of the, the the circumstances and facts around those allegations. But 
alleged that they spent $600,000, the three of them, to invest in Tim Ballard's for-profit operation. And I just thought when I heard that, I'm like, how much money do these men have that it was no big deal for them to take 200,000 each on average? Maybe one gave 100 and another one gave 300. Who knows? But three men, $600,000. How much money do you have to have laying around for you to go, I'm going to invest in this for-profit venture of this other guy and I'm going to give $200,000. You have to have so much money laying around to do that. And allegedly, Elder Ballard is one of the main proponents of Tim Ballard's work and was a silent partner and invested money to the point where Tim Ballard's for-profit operation has as its address listed Elder Ballard's son's business address. So that tells you at least the appearance of some deep connection between the Ballard family, Elder Ballard and his son, and Tim Ballard. But you have to have so much money, so much. Um, anyway, so I just want to note, they're willing to give up all of it, except for what is most important. And that is that these 15 men continue to get to dictate who is the next generation of leaders. And almost always that tends to be someone within the family. And they get to maximize the money that's in this church. And on some level, they get to access that fund, those funds personally. They get a living stipend. They get a vehicle. They get the best health insurance on the planet. They get free education for their kids and maybe their grandkids. They, they get first-class travel on airplanes. They, they get everything. You look at these men, they live to be old. It's not because they, uh, God is protecting them. It's because they have the best damn health care in the world. And if you and I had the best damn health care in the world, we would all live into our 80s and 90s as well. Most of us. And most of them. Once in a great while, one of them has, uh, has a heart attack or a stroke or whatever and, and dies early. But for the most part, across the board right now, these men are all almost all in their late 70s, 80s, 90s. President Nelson is 99 years old running this church. They're willing to give up the theology. They're willing to give up the, they'll change the branding. They're willing to uh, teach doctrines that are contradictory to the doctrines they used to teach. But you will not find a day uh, in my lifetime for sure. And uh, for the for the youngest person watching this show, it won't be in your lifetime either. These 15 men will maintain control uh, by passing it down through their family line. And uh, they will uh, maintain the power structure and the financial wealth. And to them, those two things are the most important things to maintain in Mormonism. Thank you for joining today. Please leave your comment. Please like and subscribe. Please donate. Go to uh, mdpodcast.org or mormondiscussions.org or mormondiscussionpodcast.org and hit the donate button. Send a few bucks our way. Uh, but just keep an eye on Mormonism. It will keep changing and shifting, but notice what doesn't change and then notice collectively what does. Otherwise, have a great day. Thanks for joining and uh, see you next time.